Colorado, 1853. Despite the vibrant colors of spring all around him, Little Robe rides with a heavy heart. Even the placid stirring of the Platte River has failed to soothe his weary heart and frazzled nerves as morning melts into the warm afternoon. He is making his way south to the largest village of his tribe, the feared and formidable Cheyenne. His mind has been caught under a cloud of dread for weeks now, as had many of the Cheyenne. His band's beloved chief, a respected warrior named Alights on a Cloud, has been killed in a battle against their hated enemies, the Pawnee. For weeks now, the Pawnee have raided, abused, and outright murdered their way through several smaller Cheyenne encampments. Now, Little Robe is out to seek help. And, not long after he turns down Beaver Creek, a tributary of the Platte River, his spirits lift. He spots the large Cheyenne village already stirring with activity. This is always a busy time of year, just before the summer buffalo hunts. For the Cheyenne, it is the time of the Medicine Lodge ceremony, their most important ceremony of the year. But this year, the camp is even more abuzz than normal. For days now, visitors from smaller bands have been pouring into the camp. They seek refuge from the Pawnee onslaught, hoping the sheer numbers of people in the larger camp will afford them some relative measure of safety. But also, perhaps just as pertinently, they seek revenge. In the recent weeks, many had seen their loved ones killed and their possessions ransacked by the Pawnee. As Little Robe rides into the camp, he sees a line of people gathered in front of the largest lodges in the village. Each waiting Cheyenne carries with them a gift of some kind, from blankets to food, with some even bringing horses. Inside the lodges are gathered the vaunted warrior societies of the Cheyenne. The Fox Warrior Society, the Elk Warrior Society, the Shield Warrior Society, and the Dog Warrior Society. Each band holds a revered place in the Cheyenne, serving as part military force part police force, and part hunting party. Little Robe is here to visit all of them. For the preceding week, he has traveled all over the territory. He and other messengers had beseeched the Kiowa, the Burnt Thigh Sioux, the Apache, and their always stalwart allies, the Arapaho, to come to their aid in avenging the Pawnee attacks. Now, Little Robe seeks to gain the unified support of all the Cheyenne warrior society. He makes his way from lodge to lodge, informing the heads of each society as to the nature of his visit, and reinforcing the stories of Pawnee atrocities being decried by the Cheyenne outside their lodge doors. To each headman, Little Robe presents a pipe of war. Taking four draws from the pipe signifies the headman's commitment of his society's services in combating the Pawnee. Each war chief, from Kit Fox, shield, elk, bowstring, and dog societies respectively pledged their and their band's allegiance to combating their hated enemies. Within a few days, their allies who have also committed to the fight also begin to pour into the camp. The Kiowa, the Apache, the Burnt Leg Sioux, a few Crow warriors, and the Arapaho all come to the camp eager to hunt down the Pawnee and avenge their prior losses. But before any warriors from any tribe can take to the warpath, there is first the matter of the medicine ceremony. Often misunderstood as a test of metal, the medicine ceremony, a common practice in many Northern Plains tribes, consisted of days of fasting, chanting, and dancing, all while tethered to a large pole in the lodge via leather cords pierced through the skin of their upper chest. Young men are generally selected or volunteer to subject themselves to the torturous ceremony, but it is seen as more of a spiritual quest than a public demonstration of pain tolerance. It is the Kit Fox soldiers who will be heading up this endeavor, as they are often deferred to, especially amongst the Northern Cheyenne. Thus, they are bound by Cheyenne tradition to participate in the medicine ceremony. The ceremony is a central aspect of Cheyenne society, one few outsiders at this time have been privy to witness. However, 
George Bird Grinnell, an American anthropologist, historian, naturalist, and author of The Fighting Cheyenne, as well as The Cheyenne Indians and Their History and Life Ways, links to purchase in the description, gives the following description. The afternoon before the sacrifice was to be made, the warrior and two older warriors who had been through the ceremony before and were to serve as his instructors went out to cut the pole to which he was to be tied. When a young cottonwood tree suitable for the pole was found, they grasped his arms and caused him to move his hands four times towards the tree, as if cutting it with an axe. Then he cut the pole without further ceremony. They now caused him to pick it up from the ground, making four motions before lifting it, and then four motions before dragging it away to the chosen place for the sacrifice. When the place was reached, the instructors showed him how to dig the hole in which it was to stand, making four preliminary motions before actually beginning to dig the hole. The pole was not trimmed. The leaves and branches were left on it. That night after the three had reached camp, a messenger was sent about the camp to find and borrow two braided rawhide riatas. Next morning the three men arose very early, and long before daylight, each instructor took one of the ropes and rubbed his hands down over its whole length four times. Then a coal was taken from the fire, sweet grass sprinkled on it, and each rope was passed four times through the smoke. Then, to one end of each rope, were tied two deerskin strings, each seven or eight inches long. Each rope was now doubled into a ball in the middle, leaving the end to which the strings were tied to be attached to the skewers in his body four or five feet long, and on the other end to be tied to the pole somewhat longer. Just before daylight, the instructors painted him white with clay over the whole body. After he had been painted, they caused him to sit and filled and lighted a pipe, and offered him to smoke it four times, and each time he smoked. The pipe was held to his mouth. He did not touch it with his hands. After he had smoked, the instructors told him that their direction to perform this sacrifice was the greatest favor that he could have received. The privilege to stand by a pole in the sun's road where the sun could look down and see him. It might be a hard trial, but he must not give up. After he had received this instruction, he set out with two older men to go to the place where the pole was. When they set out, he walked in advance, wrapped in a buffalo robe and carrying two ropes. The instructors followed. When they reached the place where the pole was, the warrior sat down near the pole. While waiting, the two instructors tied the two ropes to the pole. South of the pole, and facing southward, was placed a buffalo skull. Now it was time for him to be pierced. He knelt, sitting back on his heels, and rested his hands on his knees, opposite to and facing the pole. The instructors knelt at his right side and with charcoal marked upright parallel lines on the skin on the right breast to indicate where the knife should enter and where it should come out. One instructor then took the skin in his fingers above the marks and the other below the marks, and pinching up the skin, they thrust in the knife at the marked place on the right, and it came through at the marked place on the other side. The left breast was pierced in the same way. When the right breast was pierced, the instructors, assisting each other, passed a small straight stick, the length of a finger, through the slit, and to this skewer tied the strings on one of the ropes. After the left breast was pierced, a similar skewer was passed through that slit and tied. After the strings had been tied, the instructors raised the warrior to his feet and supported and directed him as he walked the sage-covered path towards the pole. Then the instructors pulled four times on his breast to straighten out the ropes. They moved his body toward the east and then toward the west, four times. Then he began to walk to the west end of the sage-covered trail, and back to the east end, going back and forth until the sun had set. It seemed to him to take the sun a long time to reach the middle, but the time from the middle to the sun's setting was much longer. He was constantly trying to break loose, but the skin of his breast did not break, it only stretched. He had the privilege of resting four times, in the middle of the forenoon, at noon, 
in the middle of the afternoon and just before sunset. At each of these rests, he might smoke a pipe. During the day, the instructors built a sweat house in the camp. At sundown, they came to the warrior, grasped his arms, one on each side, and pushed him down to a sitting position. They cut through the stretched hide of his breast, took him back to the camp, and entered the sweat lodge with him, some other men who had made this sacrifice also going into it. His wounds and the blood on his body were wiped off with white sage. On each of the three following days he took a sweat, and on the fourth day the ceremony was finished. The Kit Fox soldiers all take part, as do warriors from many of the other societies. On the final day of the ceremony, two Cheyenne warriors named Wood and Two Thighs, chiefs of the Kit Fox soldiers, speak about finding where the Cheyenne are located. Wood says, Now, this is the last day of the dance. We are not far from the country of the Pawnees, and it is time for us to choose scouts and send them out to find the Pawnee camp. Two Thighs concurs and suggests a young warrior named Mad Wolf, saying, There is Mad Wolf over there. He is pretty cunning. Let us choose him for one. They also summon Tall Bull, Starving Elk, and Little Wolf, all fellow Cheyenne, as well as Yellow Bear, an Arapaho warrior, and Dirt on the Nose from the Kiowas. All seven warriors are brought to the Kit Fox Soldier Lodge, where a blanket is spread out in front of the door. They are all ordered to sit on the blanket, as the Kit Fox Chief Wood addresses them, saying, Now, my friends, you know what the feeling is in this camp, that we want to find the enemy. You men have been chosen for this purpose because we think that you are good men, and we want you to go ahead and to do your best. You must remember you are not going out to count coup, nor to take any scalps nor horses, but we are going to find where the enemy is, and then to bring back the news to the camp. I intend to go along with you to see that you do as you are told. You can go now and get your horses and start on down the river. I will go ahead and I will stop at a certain place where we will all meet late this afternoon. Chief Wood sets out ahead of the younger warriors as they go to gather their horses and weapons. The chief now rides several miles down Beaver Creek before stopping on a high ridge from which he can easily see the surrounding landscape. Here, he waits on the party of young warriors. After a few hours, the warriors show up. They are, much to the chief's dismay, accompanied by three other young warriors who had not been invited, but have insisted on tagging along. However, the chief acquiesces to their presence as they are too far from the main camp to send them back alone. The group travels on for a day and a half, sleeping little, stopping only once for a quick meal and a short repose for themselves and their horses. Finally, in the afternoon of their second day of travel, they come upon a pack of wolves feasting on a buffalo carcass. The warriors chase the wolves off in order to better inspect the carcass. Embedded deep in the hulking animal's torso is an arrow with markings they all recognize as Pawnee. Yellow Bear, a dog soldier of the Arapaho, rides to the top of a nearby hill, only to return rapidly with news that he has spotted three Pawnee riders heading south over a hill about a mile away. The young warrior, now flushed with the desire for combat, begins to ride in circles, singing his war song and insisting they give chase. Chief Wood, patiently but firmly, walks up to Yellow Bear's horse and grabs hold of the reins, stopping the animal. He then speaks calmly, but resolutely, saying, My friend, we came out here to find the enemy, and then to go back and report to the village. We did not come out to take scalps, nor to count coup. Let us do what we came to do, and nothing else. In no position to disagree, the younger warrior defers to his chief's wishes, and the party makes haste back to the Cheyenne village. After another grueling ride back, taking another day and a half, the party rides into camp bringing with them the fruits of their reconnaissance. They inform their friends, families, and fellow warriors that the Pawnee have been spotted. In order to capitalize on this opportunity, 
they must take to the trail back to the Pawnee as soon as possible. However, as with all raids, hunts, and special occasions, the Cheyenne and all of their allies have to make right with their perceived spirit world. Before the ceremony, all of the warrior bands are told to send forth a pair of representatives in full war regalia. Every society sends forth their representatives, fully armed and painted for war. They march in an extended line, spaced out roughly 100 yards from each other, through the center of the village. Turning left, they amass just outside of the village. Two elder chiefs ritually cleanse and bless the tribe's sacred bundle of arrows known as the Medicine Arrows, as well as a buffalo skull cap known as the Medicine Hat. These are considered items of great spiritual power, whose possession comes with a weighty responsibility to protect the arrows and uphold the virtues they represent. Once this ceremony is finished, the war paint is washed off and the weapons sheathed. All the lodges are broken down and packed up, and the village is made ready to move down the creek. Spirits are high, as many in the group have come to this camp specifically to seek revenge for the Pawnee attacks wrought upon them. The next day, the camp moves out and heads down the stream several miles before stopping and re-establishing a new site. While the women work on setting up the lodges, the chiefs again assemble and call out a roster of names they have agreed to send out on another scouting mission. They call upon Tall Bull and Warbonnet, two of the warriors from the original reconnaissance squad that had gone forward a few days earlier. A dog soldier named Wolfface is assigned to accompany this squad as are three other dog soldiers. They are ordered to ready their horses and their weapons. But this time, there will be no ceremony. Now, there are only the cold, hard calculations of combat. The party assembles and leaves immediately heading south again towards where the Pawnee had been previously seen. They travel all through the afternoon and most of the night. They sleep fleetingly for a few hours before the sun rises, then again take to the trail. In the early afternoon, they come to the location where Tall Bull had originally seen the Pawnee. They top the hill that Tall Bull had originally seen the Pawnee flee over, only to come upon a large, empty space on the prairie dotted with smoldering campfires, buffalo carcasses, and stray Pawnee dogs. To the southwest of this camp, the warriors spot a trail that leads over another hill. The six warriors ride to the top of that hill, hopping off their mounts and crawling towards the crest of the ridge that overlooks the valley that sweeps down before it. At the bottom of the valley, tucked next to the creek, is the large village of Pawnees. Tall Bull and Wolfface slip down into the stream bed above the village and silently work their way down towards the village for a closer look. They see a massive campfire in the middle of a large circle of many Pawnee men, women, and children all circling the fire and dancing. Off to one side stand a contingent of warriors from another tribe. The young Cheyenne recognize them as Shawnee, longtime allies of the Pawnee whose homelands are far to the east. The two Cheyenne warriors observe the camp for a while, then slip back to their waiting comrades to inform them of what they've seen. Tall Bull sees this as a prime opportunity for all of them to pad their warrior resumes. He suggests that they all, one by one, cover themselves with blankets, disguising themselves as one of the Pawnee. Then, he says, they can sneak into the camp to mingle with the Pawnee and their allies. Each time any of them touched a Pawnee or one of their allies, they would be able to count it as a coup. Counting coup is a well-known and oft-mythologized practice among many of the Northern Plains tribes. The practice involved getting close enough to an enemy to touch him, either with a special rod known as a coup stick, or by bow, or by hand. Doing so demonstrated the warrior's fearlessness of the enemy and garnered him accolades demonstrated in the way of either feathers added to a war bonnet or some other form of material compensation. On this day, though, one of the other Cheyenne warriors manages to talk Tall Bull down from his grand ambitions. No, we had better not do that, the Cheyenne warrior said. 
we were not sent here to count coup or to mingle with these people, but to find the camp. Let us go back. Letting discretion be the better part of valor, the group makes its way back to the village to report that they had found the Pawnee. After a hard ride, they arrive back to the Cheyenne village and inform their cohorts of what they have discovered. The camp erupts into a flurry of activity as the men ready their weapons and the women erect tall platforms on which to leave their buffalo meat and sundries out of reach of the hungry wolves. The entire camp, stripped down to its bare essentials, moves in the direction of the Pawnee. The men ride in front, with the women and children kept well behind. Another arduous day and a half of travel finds them within five miles of the Pawnee village. The women and children all converge behind a large hill, hidden from sight and under the watch of a contingent of warriors on guard. The men then ride forward, still hidden from the Pawnee, and carry out their medicine ceremony. The sacred hat is placed on the ground, atop a bed of stems and sage. An arrow is then taken from the sacred bundle and given to Woodleg, who points it towards the Pawnee camp and sings the arrow song. As he does so, Woodleg stomps his feet in time with the song. The rest of the dog soldiers, Kit Fox soldiers, Bowstring soldiers, Elk soldiers, and their Arapaho and Kiowa allies begin to stomp in time as well. Wooden Leg begins to stab the arrow in the direction of the Pawnee, stomping harder and harder. The rest of the warrior force, in turn, stomps harder as well. They too begin to thrust their spears and bows in the direction of the Pawnee village. Finally, Woodleg finishes his song to the subdued whoops of his comrades, still far enough away from the Pawnee that they cannot be heard. Woodleg then passes the arrow back to Rock Forehead, keeper of the medicine arrows. Long Chin, a respected dog soldier, then rides up to the keeper of the medicine hat. He will be the warrior to wear the hat on this day, and he accepts the responsibility somberly but excitedly. Black Kettle, a legendary Cheyenne chief who would be killed years later in the Sand Creek Massacre, was chosen to tie the medicine arrows to his lance. The Cheyenne are now ready, their warrior medicine fully prepared. Then, as they make one last head count before heading out towards the Pawnee village, they find themselves sickened to realize that Big Head, a young, arrogant warrior, had taken off earlier with eight younger warriors intending to amass their own glory before their comrades could arrive. Breaking formation like this is not only a poor tactical decision, it is, for the Cheyenne, a metaphysical disaster. The medicine that they had so meticulously cultivated for this battle is now broken. This, to say the least, is now a bad situation for the Cheyenne and their allies. But there is no turning back now. Their cover will have been blown by the premature raiding party, and if they do not attack now, they may soon find themselves and their families caught and killed by the Pawnee and their allies. The main force now charges forward, under the navigational direction of Tallbowl and Wolfface. But when they crest the hill overlooking the valley, they find the Pawnee village is gone. All in the party realize the pertinence of their pursuit, though, and without hesitation, the party begins to make its way down the creek in one direction and then the other, in a desperate search for their Pawnee enemy. Then they spot a group of mounted warriors coming straight at them. The Cheyenne make their way towards this party, thinking them to be Pawnee. However, as the two parties near each other, the Cheyenne recognize the oncoming group as Big Head and his group of young absconders. Big Head is covered in blood and holding the fresh scalp of a Pawnee. But despite his newly acquired trophy, he wears the face of a young warrior who has bitten off more than he had initially bargained for. But there is no time to berate him or his followers as finding the Pawnee is the first order of business. The camp is right over the hill, Big Head informs them, before warily adding, go slowly, for there are many of them. The Cheyenne, without further conversation, then converge and attack over the hill. 
To their horror, just as Big Head had warned, the Pawnee and their allies had now amassed for battle in a defensive formation on the riverbank. The opposing warrior force seems too numerous to count. Believing themselves to have no other option, though, the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Kiowa make charge after charge, each with increasing ferocity and decreasing personnel, as the Pawnee proceed to pick off the mounted warriors from their defensive positions. The battle rages on for the bulk of the day, with the Cheyenne taking significant losses. Then, about mid-afternoon, they spot a party of Shawnee flanking their position and taking up their own positions atop another hill to their right. The Kiowa insist that they too are allies with the Shawnee. They will, they say, simply make their way over to the Shawnee and recruit them to switch sides. This plan, however, falls through immediately as the first Kiowa emissary sent forward is summarily shot dead before he even reaches the Shawnee lines. Seeing this, the Cheyenne retreat back to the top of another hill, further from the Shawnee position. The Shawnee give chase, only to be driven back by the Cheyenne. Finally, two Shawnee who venture out too close to the Cheyenne are ridden down and killed. One is lanced by the legendary Kiowa chief Santanta, the other shot dead by a Cheyenne named Good Bear. The Pawnee now arrive to reinforce their allies, and an intense, sizable assault is made on the Cheyenne over the course of the next few minutes. In the ensuing bloodshed, 17 Cheyenne warriors, four Arapaho warriors, and several Kiowa warriors are killed. Seeing their medicine as truly broken, and all hope being lost, the Cheyenne and their allies make the agonizing decision to retreat leaving their dead comrades to the mutilations of the Pawnee. They ride hard and fast back to their families. When they arrive back to the Cheyenne camp, great moans and wails float up from the prairie as newly widowed women are informed of their beloved husband's fates. There is no time to grieve, however. Amidst their tears, the Cheyenne make a desperate hurry to march north. They know the Pawnee will be out for revenge and time is of the essence. It is not until they reach the territory of Beaver Creek, another day and a half of hard riding later, that the events of the previous few days can be given time to truly sink in. The funeral ceremonies are carried out, and a period of great despair takes hold over the Cheyenne camp. But there is still a harsh winter to prepare for, and now, with fewer warriors on hand, this summer's buffalo hunt will be an even more dangerous and arduous endeavor. Life in the Old West is a cruel, harsh, and often short affair. For the Cheyenne and for the Pawnee, who, despite their victory, have lost many warriors as well, this cycle of viciousness and vengeance was the inescapable reality of life on the plains. The stories of great tragedies, unspeakable violence, inspiring cooperation, and harrowing endurance are too numerous to mention amongst the Cheyenne, Pawnee, or any of their allies. All are tales worthy of great reverence and respect. But for tonight, those are other stories for other times. Thank you for joining us. Don't forget to hit like, share, subscribe, help support our work by becoming a Patreon subscriber, and we'll see you next time here on History at the OK Corral, History to Real for the Westerns.